The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Andy Duncan, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Today, on the 4th of December, I'm speaking to Jeff Berwick. He's the founder of The Dollar Vigilante, the CEO of TDV Media and Services, and the host of the popular podcast series, Anacast. Good afternoon, Jeff. Great to be on with you, Andrew. The financial state of the world at the moment, let's start really big. How do you see it? Oh, it's a mess. <laughs> uh, but uh, to be more uh, specific, um, I think I always look at it going back to 1913 with the founding of the Fed and the institution of income tax in the U.S. as being the first nail in the coffin of this financial system. And, of course, it lasted quite a while and it still exists today. Uh, but then in 1971, when Richard Nixon took the gold last vestige of gold backing away from the dollar, that really put the uh, the final nail in it. And since then, it's all been baked in the cake, a uh, completely fiat currency system, unbacked in a world full of socialist, uh, democratic nation states. Uh, it, was, it was baked in the cake that we'd have massive amounts of debt now. And that's what we have in the U.S. is uh, almost $17 trillion now. Uh, and if you take in uh, unfunded debt and liabilities, it's uh, about $80, $80 trillion or higher, uh, which works out to $250,000 per person in the U.S. Uh, so a family of four would have a million dollars of federal government debt and liabilities overhanging it. And it's, it's very similar in many other countries, including the U.K. and, and most of Western Europe and Canada, uh, many other countries, uh, most of the Western uh, uh the, the ones that really adhered to this financial system, including Japan, are all in massive amounts of debt now. And uh, that's why we're at 0% interest rates until the system collapses, in my opinion, because they can't actually allow those rates to rise because it will uh, put all, almost all these governments into default. The hostess factory collapsing in the United States, do you think that was the first major public boil bursting on the face of the American economy? Oh, this has been going on for a long time. Uh, if you look at the, the real economic activity in the U.S., it's been on a down. Uh, downward spiral for at least since 2000. That, I think that's really when the depression began. Of course, I don't listen to GDP statistics. That really does not mean growth. Uh, that's a tracking of spending. Uh, so obviously spending does not mean growth. Uh, savings means growth and, and no one saves anymore in the West. Uh, so uh, I, that Twinkie thing uh, was interesting. I think it brought some people's attention to what's going on, but we're going to see more and more and more. And it's going to be unbelievable uh, the amount of uh, closures in the U.S. Uh, you'll see entire malls just shutting down pretty soon. Uh, it's a, a large part because of all the debt, and it's also because of all the government regulations that they're instituting now. I believe Barack Obama has instituted something like 6,000 new regu regulations in the last three months. So it's completely out of control. You can't really do business anymore in the U.S. Uh, it's it's uh, very difficult. It's getting more and more difficult. And with all this debt overhanging the system, and of course it's a debt-based system, and that's just the way it, it was always going to evolve, uh, there really is no uh, bright future for uh, the Western nation states at this point. Uh, there might be after they collapse, but until that collapse happens, uh, it's a one-way street. Now, it's very hard to predict where the black swan's going to land or when it's going to land, which is going to cause this paper money collapse. But do you have any bets on any kind of horses as to which black swan is going to land first? Well, to me, the sky is covered in black swans. We're in a <laughs> giant shadow right now. I, you know, it's, anything could happen. But really, uh, we're getting very close to something major happening. I think in 2008, George Soros, who I rarely agree with, but I agree with him on this one, he said the financial system did collapse. But they just kept it alive by inflating. And so that's their only option left now is to keep inflating and keep hoping that people don't catch on to what's really going on, which is the collapse of this system. And uh, so anything could happen. Uh, you could see uh, people returning their U.S. dollars to the U.S. at some point uh, for whatever reason. And that, uh, with so many U.S. dollars all around the world, that would cause uh, pretty much hyperinflation very quickly. I'm not uh, expecting hyperinflation in the U.S. for at least a few more years, but anything could happen. Uh, th this is a very tenuous system, and anyone who's been sitting on the sidelines thinking, well, maybe I'll wait a little while longer. Uh, to me, that's, that's really uh, being risky with your financial affairs. One thing that uh, puzzles me is the Basel III initiative is to make gold a tier one capital asset on January the 1st. 
which seems very strange after 40 years of fiat money. Do you think this could trigger the kind of end of the paper money system? Uh, no, I don't think so. And actually, we've done some research, and they've actually had that uh, 0% risk rating on gold for eight years at least. Uh, it, n- not many people know this, but you can actually look it up on the Internet. So uh, this uh, this latest supposed change isn't really a change at all. And even if it was a change, it didn't change anything eight years ago either. I'm not expecting anything the state does to, to really affect too much anymore. They've already done enough, and now it's up to the, the free market markets to uh, really sort of bring this thing down because it's, it's really standing at the cliff's edge right now. And uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't believe that, that uh, whatever Basel III said about gold, I don't think that's going to have any major effect, but I, I expect gold to continue to rise in this sort of climate. Now, when this dark sky of black swans and golden swans um, eventually delivers one of them onto the ground and everything collapses, what do you think governments are going to do to protect themselves from their own kind of financial folly and mistakes? Well, if history's any... Uh, any guide, uh, they always try to stay alive. They're like any sort of organism uh, that is dying, and they'll do anything to stay alive. And we're seeing it all over the place right now that they're, they'll, they'll start to take the more and more assets of their own tax slaves. So you look at France, they just uh, increased their top tax rate to 75%, and they're talking about a 100% tax rate. Uh, in the U.S., they've started having government hearings about uh, nationalizing the 401ks and IRAs. Uh, and, and they're very serious about that. This is, uh, this is out in the open. Of course, it's never, uh, put on the news in the U.S. because if the, uh, tax slaves heard that, they wouldn't like it too much. But, uh, you know, we'll expect the, U- the governments around the world, the Western governments, to start to just take more and more of their assets of their own citizens. And that's why I'm a huge proponent of getting your assets outside of the country. Uh, and the government, which purports to own you. And, and that's one great thing, of course, about gold money. And I really appreciate the service you have. And I'm a, a very happy client uh, because uh, it enables, it makes it very easy for people to be able to, to get into precious metals and internationalize them, which is also something I wrote a, uh, our dollar vigilante wrote a special report on called Getting Your Gold Out of Dodge. And we talked about all sorts of ways to internationalize your, your precious metals. Okay, so the governments are going to protect themselves from their own financial mistakes. So how can we protect ourselves? How can people protect themselves from government capital controls and the like? Well, I think they have to act pretty soon because you're starting to see capital controls happening all over the place. Italy's started to institute them. Argentina, uh, Argentina does it every 10 years, but that should be some sort of guide for what's going to be happening. Uh, really internationalizing your assets is incredibly important. And that's, that's one of the biggest things we talk about. And, uh, of course, precious metals or any hard asset that Ben Bernanke can't counterfeit is an excellent uh, way to protect yourself from it. But don't keep it all in the one country where you live because those governments you, you saw in 1933 in the U.S., they, they confiscated gold. I don't know if they'll confiscate it again, but they could tax it at a high level. So if you go to sell your gold, they could tax it at 90% uh, profit rates or whatever they want. Uh, so uh, it's very important to really internationalize your asset. Is there anything else people should be doing as well? Um, that's, that's really the big thing. I also uh, encourage people to get a second uh, foreign passport because uh, what we're starting to see is these governments starting to clamp down and make it so you can't even open accounts in other countries. Uh, gold money, for example, uh, the Dutch government in the Netherlands uh, said that the, their uh, their tax slaves are not allowed to open a gold money account. So if you only if you live in the Netherlands and you only have a Dutch passport, uh, you are you have one less option that day. And they can continue to do all those sort of things as capital controls increase. So it's, uh, we really recommend people get second passports, and that's uh, something we do at tdvpassports.com. Let's imagine that we've got through to the other side of whatever we're going to see in the next few years, and everything has readjusted itself back to some kind of cleared-out normality. What do you see that's going to be on the other side? Are we still going to have government-controlled money, or are we ha- going to have free private enterprise monies? There's no way to know, and that's why you really have to be cautious at this point in time. This is going to be the biggest event in human history when the fiat currencies collapse. So it's really important to be cautious. Uh, there's no way to know. Hopefully we do go to a free market money. The, the government should not be involved in money. They shouldn't be involved in anything. They shouldn't even exist. They're an unnecessary evil, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, anything could happen. We, you see the Soviet Union, they had a depression for 60 years because the government kept hanging on and hanging on and it kept instituting all of their ludicrous communist ideas. Uh, so uh, government can, can do anything, but I think thanks to the Internet, we have a lot of opportunity to spread knowledge, and the more people who understand what's really going on, uh, the better chance we have to get past what's going to occur with the, the great transition, as I call it, and to, to a better, peaceful, uh, more free world. Okay, I'd just like you to imagine a moment, if, if you can, this uh, idea of a completely stateless world. 
what do you think private monies would look like in this ideal stateless world? Well, that would be a beautiful world. I don't know if we'll ever see it, but I hope we do. Um, you know, there'd be things like gold money. Gold money would be money. Uh, uh, PayPal could be its own currency. Uh, Bitcoin, I'm a big proponent of. I really like Bitcoin. But of course, in a free market world, we really, really wouldn't need Bitcoin as much. Bitcoin's necessary in this sort of world where there's so much state control, uh, so much lack of freedom and, and regulations and taxes. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, the, who knows? The, the free market, when it's uh, unrestrained, can do anything. And that, of course, Bitcoin is a, a free market money. Uh, and that's just probably one of the first technological uh, free market monies that's come out. So we could see anything uh, happen. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me, though, if, if gold and silver were a major backing behind some of the major free market currencies. Now, you're trying to build a little part of your own ideal world uh, in a place called Gold Gulch in Chile. Can you uh, tell us about that? Certainly. Um, at, from Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Ay Rand's book uh, was Gold Gulch, where uh, it's really describing the world of today, where the governments have become out of control. The non-productive people are taking... Uh, a lot of the assets from the productive people through taxation, and it's making it very difficult for productive people to be productive. So in Atlas Shrugged, they, they all went to a beautiful little uh, area surrounded by mountains. It happened to be in the U.S., but we don't recommend doing that anymore. Uh, so we found a place that, that looked just like it in Chile. It's, it's a beautiful place, and we're trying to attract people who are productive and, and freedom-loving from around the world to come live there. And, uh, yeah, we called it Galt's Gulch, and it's going to be a really uh, amazing place, in my opinion. You didn't feel like calling it Berwick's Gulch, then? <laughs> no, it has not too much to do with me. This is all about the freedom movement and, and really just trying to uh, create uh, at least areas or pockets where there is a lot of freedom. And Chile is a great place to do that. It's one of the most libertarian places on Earth right now. And uh, their, even their bank, uh, their central bank, isn't Keynesian. They're, they're more of a, a different style, uh, which they, they don't really inflate anywhere near as much as Keynesians do. Uh, so it's, it's a much better place. It's sort of, I look at it as sort of the way the U.S. probably looked about 100 years ago. So were you unable then to build such a place in Acapulco in Mexico then? Well, I had a number of requirements, and, uh, and Mexico didn't meet a few of them. For, first of all, it's too close to the U.S. for comfort. <laughs> and uh, I see the U.S. involvement down here all the time through their ludicrous drug war and, and, uh, and uh, all sorts of things they do down here with, uh, with uh, the NAFTA, and, and they're even talking about a, a North American uh, uh, currency union and all sorts of things. So, so it didn't meet my requirement in that respect. I love Acapulco. I, I live here currently. Uh, but uh, to build Gold's Gulch, we want it to be uh, quite a ways away from uh, the Western world uh, as we know it, and also uh, in a much uh, place, a place where the governments are much, much smaller, and that's the case in Chile. We see lots of fences in Mexico um, from the American border to keep Mexicans out. Do you think eventually when the U.S. collapses, we're going to see fences in Mexico to keep Americans out? Absolutely. It's already begun. The uh, the amount of Mexicans coming from the U.S. to Mexico now now exceeds the amount of Mexicans going to the U.S. And I talk to people down here all the time, and many of them tell me the same thing, that they left for two reasons. One, there's n there's no not a lot of opportunity left in the U.S. It's, it's, it's because of all the regulations and taxes and government involvement. And two, there's not a lot of freedom. You can't really do a lot of things that you could do down here, like walk around on the street with a beer, which which will end up uh, with you being kidnapped in the U.S. and thrown in a cage. So, uh, yeah, I really believe that uh, we will see that kind of point where that happens. And we're already starting to see it. There's a flood of Americans moving down to Mexico right now, despite all of the propaganda put out by their government about how dangerous it is. And they're all making better lives down here, where it's a lot freer. And, and it's really a sad case because, of course, 100 years ago, people went to the U.S. for that same reason. And now they're all having to flee. Now, you've, you've become one of the best known and most prominent believers in a totally voluntary society. And you went on this journey after the sale of your Canadian company, Stockhouse.com. Can you tell us which books and which writers and which ideas helped you most on that journey to become this believer in the totally voluntary society? I remember the, one of the biggest points was when I came across an article by someone who's become my mentor now, Doug Casey. And it was a very simple article about, uh, I, ha I happened to be traveling at the time. And so, uh, uh, he wrote an article saying, when you go through those customs in different countries, don't be nice to them because they have no right to be asking you where you're going and what you're doing. And and that really struck a chord with me. And I ended up reading everything Doug Casey wrote for months on end. And then I met Doug Casey and he sat down with me and he asked me some questions. And he said, uh, at the end of it, he said, you know what you are? And I said, what? And he said, you're a libertarian. And I'd never even heard that word before. So I spent another few months reading up on libertarianism 
Uh, and then uh, pretty quickly after that, you, you pretty much realize you're an anarchist once you realize that you, you have no interest in, in the state. You don't. Uh, there's no use for the state, no useful purpose. It's actually very dangerous and a very bad thing. And uh, so there was many books. One of the big books that uh, really turned me into an anarchist was The uh, Market for Liberty by the Tannehills. It's a very small book. It's actually available for free on the Internet. It's, you can read it in a few hours. And it just shows you how the world would be without government involvement. For example, courts... Uh, People, if there was free courts, if there was private courts, uh, you wouldn't have to wait years to get a court date, and it wouldn't cost hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. It would it would be over in a day. And and if courts, if there was a certain court that was doing something wrong, they'd go out of business. And if there was courts that were really good, they'd get all the business, just like in a free market. So it just uh, it really opens your eyes to the opportunities, and it's really exciting uh, a world without all this government involvement. What it would, what it would look like. You also run several popular websites. Can you tell our listeners how to read up on the information that you're putting out on these websites? Absolutely. If uh, if you're interested in just general information on what we've been talking about here, you just go to dollarvigilante.com. Uh, you can put your email right in our on the front page, and we send out a daily blog where we talk about all these sort of issues on on how to get yourself outside of these government controls, how to free yourself, how to profit from what's going on through investing in, in things like gold and even gold stocks. And uh, and that sort of a thing. And if you're interested, we also have a, a actual newsletter, a paid for newsletter, and we have a lot more information in that newsletter. Uh, and you can also go at uh, we uh, have a passport site I mentioned already, tvpassports.com. And uh, also a really important one, especially with what gold money is doing, is we wrote that special report called Getting Your Gold Out of Dodge. And you can just go to goldoutofdodge.com and you can get access to that report. And just before we wrap up, uh, what are your predictions for which of the major Western areas is going to go first? Will it be Japan? Will it be Europe? Will it be the United States? Or will it be some other part of the Western world? Yeah, it's a crapshoot. Uh, I'm, I'm leaning towards Japan at the moment. Uh, there's so many things that have been happening in Japan that have really tilted the table against them. Uh, for one, they used to be a massive exporter, but after the tsunami, with all their oil imports, they're actually now a net importer. Uh, and that was really one of the things that enabled them to, to keep going as long as they did with their massive amount of debt. They have something like 600% debt to GDP. And uh, as well, the demographics, they're, they're quite xenophobic. They don't allow a lot of people to come in and create uh, new products and produce and much of their population is getting older now and so a lot of those people who were producing they're all retiring now so it's uh it's it's looking like a big mess is going to be happening over there and i think soon uh, and that actually uh you know funnily enough might help the u.s dollar for for a period uh, because if the yen collapses a lot of people will be panicking and running into other things and one of the things they might stupidly run into is the u.s dollar when they should be running into hard assets so do you think it will be Europe then after Japan? Uh, yeah, who knows? Uh, there's su- such a mess in Europe. I, th- I, I think at this moment, uh, the European Central Bank has been very clear about their intentions. Uh, they have no intention of letting the euro die, which means they're going to have to print a lot of money, which will lead to hyperinflation. Uh, just a matter of how long that will take. It might take a year or two. It might take three or four years. But it's, it's definitely all headed in the wrong direction as well. Okay, it's been great talking to you today, Jeff. Uh, Thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.